let's go. Coming up, Starlink files new design for Dishy with the FCC. SpaceX flies two missions over the past three days, one to launch a new SiriusXM satellite, the other to resupply the International Space Station. But first, Bezos and Senator Cantwell may have just cost the U.S. taxpayer $10 billion and delayed the moon mission, as the Senate passes the very controversial Innovation and Competitiveness Act. Over the past few episodes, I have been documenting the saga of the human lander development contract for NASA's Artemis program. In mid-April, SpaceX won the sole source contract with a price tag of $2.89 billion, beating out rival Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos, and the smaller Dianetics. After the award, both Bezos, Blue Origin, and Dianetics filed protests with the Government Accountability Office, GAO, both citing flawed acquisition, issues with evaluation processes, failure to comply with the federal procurement statutes and regulations, and issues and concerns with the award process that was awarded as a sole source contract and not a two-party selection. Both were under the assumption there would be a lead and a backup company selected at this point, not a sole source directly to SpaceX. But our boy Bezos did not stop at a protest. He quickly ran back to his headquarters state of Washington to meet with Senator Maria Cantwell to complain about the process and that NASA was not including a backup plan to SpaceX. Cantwell, who's the chair of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation, quickly drafted an amendment to a bill that was being debated on the Senate floor that would authorize but not appropriate an additional $10 billion to the Artemis program through fiscal 2026. It also calls for NASA to pick a second winner for the contract, one that, if funded, will almost certainly fall in the lap of Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin, with a budget almost 5x of that of SpaceX. Yesterday, on June 8th, we saw the passage of the U.S. Innovation and Competitiveness Act, designed to bolster U.S. competitiveness with China and improved technology and research and development, but also included Cantwell's $10 billion amendment. The bill passed the Senate with bipartisan support, 68 to 32. The bill now heads to the House of Representatives, where it will be debated on the floor. When this will happen, no one knows, but it is unlikely to happen prior to the GAO's findings. Not that it may matter, if the bill becomes law, NASA will then be required to select a second winner, regardless of the outcomes of the GAO's investigation. NASA's head administrator, Bill Nelson, threw his support behind the bill saying, the U.S. Innovation and Competitiveness Act, which includes the NASA authorization bill, is an investment in the scientific research and technological innovation that will help ensure the U.S. continues to lead in space and sets us on a path to execute many landings on the moon in this decade. I applaud the Senate passage of the bill and look forward to working with the House to see it passes into law. If the bill passes the House, and that's a huge if, it still depends on the outcome of the GAO's investigation. After all that's cleared up, it still needs appropriation of funds, which means it points right back to the executive branch and Joe Biden's new budget. So time will tell, but one thing's for certain, the path to the moon is very complicated and the future of Artemis is well, pardon the pun, up in the air. This week, we also saw a filing from Starlink for a new user terminal that's smaller. That's right, a new design for Dishy was filed with the FCC's Office of Experimental Testing. Inside of that filing, we learned a little bit about the details and the specifications of the new Dishy. The filing application requests the authority to test five new terminals in Washington, Texas, Utah, Colorado, and California and would function on the same frequencies used now in the beta. The new terminal filing has the same specs in regards to the transmitting antenna and transceiver, but different for the receiving transmitter. The receiving antenna in the new design is much smaller, thus lowering the gain, which would decrease Starlink's user terminal range, but it would increase the area that it covers, which means it could receive signals from a much wider area. This new filing is the direct result of the FCC win for the lower orbit satellites by Starlink. By providing a wider area, we can then assume the goal of mobility becomes much more feasible with a smaller dish and a broader signal. It's interesting to note the size and shape. Instead of being round, both the TX and RX antennas are now 12.2 by 12.2 inches square. 
SpaceX also had a busy week. We saw two launches in three days. It also marked the third trip of a Falcon 9 reusable rocket into space. The first mission was for SiriusXM launching a new satellite and the second was for the United States government docking their Dragon with cargo to resupply the International Space Station. As reported by Space.com's Amy Thompson, the two-stage Falcon 9 rocket blasted off at 12.26 a.m. Eastern Time from Space Launch Complex 40 here at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, marking the company's 18th launch of the year. It carried the SXM-8 digital radio satellite into orbit for customer Sirius XM. Approximately nine minutes later, the booster first stage returned to Earth, landing on one of SpaceX's two drone ships called Just Read the Instructions, stationed out in the Atlantic Ocean. The launch occurred at the start of a nearly two-hour window. The mission marked the second SpaceX launch in just three days from Florida's Space Coast, as a different Falcon 9 blasted off from Pad 39A at the nearby Kennedy Space Center on Thursday afternoon, June 3rd. Its payload, a gumdrop-shaped cargo capsule bound for the International Space Station that arrived at the orbiting laboratory on Saturday morning to deliver 7,300 pounds of science gear and supplies. The rocket's first stage booster, now with three successful launches and landings under its belt, touched down on SpaceX's Just Read the Instructions drone ship, which was waiting in the Atlantic. It marks the 87th recovery of a first stage booster for the California-based rocket manufacturer. The rocket featured in Sunday's pre-dawn launch is another historic booster, known as B1061. This flight-proven booster has carried two different astronaut crews to the space station, marking the first time humans flew on a reused booster. That historic mission blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center in April 23rd. The rocket's first flight, dubbed Crew-1, launched in November 2020. For this third flight, it switched up its cargo, carrying a 15,432-pound satellite into orbit for Sirius XM. The satellite will beam down more than 8,000 watts of content to Sirius subscribers across the US, Canada, and the Caribbean. The launch of Sirius XM's SXM-8 satellite continues a busy run of launches for SpaceX. In May, the company launched four different Starlink missions, bringing the total number of its own broadband satellites launches up to 1,737. Sunday's flight marked the second so far in June, with two more on the schedule later this month. One of those missions will launch an upgraded GPS-3 satellite for the US Space Force, and it will be the first military payload to fly on a reused rocket. To prepare for this flight, SpaceX test fired the Veteran Booster early Thursday morning, June 3rd, before the launch of the Dragon cargo mission at the neighboring launch pad. Following the test, the rocket was transported back to the hangar to be mated with its payload. SpaceX will attempt to recover the rocket's payload fairings after they jettison during the flight. The clamshell-like hardware is designed to protect the payload as the rocket flies through the atmosphere. To facilitate this type of reuse, SpaceX has deployed two boats that typically transport Dragon capsules. Go Searcher and Go Navigator are in the designated recovery zone waiting to retrieve the falling fairings. The company used to rely on a pair of net equipped boats to recover the fairings, either catching them out of mid-air or scooping them out of the water. However, SpaceX has since refined its recovery techniques and upgraded the payload fairings to better withstand a dip in the ocean. As a result, the company did dismiss our strategy and instead opted to fetch the fairings from the water after each flight, thus increasing their reusability of their rockets and many other parts of their system. It's just so funny to me. Why are we allowing the United States government to try to kill SpaceX and downplay their achievements? All the while letting Bezos cry and complain because he didn't win a contract that now gets snuck into a very, very shady bill that might cost you and I $10 billion. Now, we don't know if the bill will pass the House. We also don't know what the findings will be from the GAO investigation. However, all indications to me point to another delay for the moon landing. SpaceX continues to snuggle up with the United States government with successful resupplies. We also saw them entertain industry by launching a new satellite for Sirius XM. While SpaceX maintains a blistering launch schedule and continues to prove out the viability and reusability of its technology, Blue Origin has yet to reach orbit. Blue Origin opting rather to push press about their upcoming launch to orbit. And that press included 
Jeff Bezos and his brother being on board. But I guess when hype's all you got and you're watching your competitor stick landings like Simone Biles, it's tough to get behind the idea that you're going to get successful. But don't worry, you can always run to your hometown senator and beg her for help. Now that help comes at an easy price tag of $10 million. Is Bezos paying that? No, but he sure is crying for it. Hey, thanks for watching. But be on the lookout for a new video I'll be dropping soon where I outline a couple key players in the space arena, their technology, and I go through their each and every one of their rocket lineups. Really cool video. I hope you watch that. Till next time, I'm Hill Phantom, reminding you to always send it. Let's go.